Before we get into arc shots and techniques and things like that, there are certain things that you can do to really help your chances of passing a welding test. And so I'm going to talk for just a minute about some of those things. Number one, make sure you have the details of the welding test correct. Call ahead of time, email, call, be persistent, not rude, persistent, and find out, make sure that you know the particulars of the welding test. I've shown up for welding tests before. Hey, six inch open butt schedule 120 with 309 root and 309 stick, and guess what? Showed up and it was a consumable insert. You know, uh, never never welded one before. You know, that'll throw you a curve. That'll, that'll mess with your confidence, being thrown a monkey wrench like that. So find out the details ahead of time if you, if you at all possibly can. And if you can, practice. Schedule some time at a local tech school. If you're, if you're in, the, in the union, go to the union hall, schedule some time. Get a little practice on the exact test that you'll be taking. That's probably the biggest, the biggest tip right there. Is there a time limit for this test? Sometimes they're, they're very generous. Sometimes it's pretty strict. Sometimes you might only allow a few hours to do a pipe test start to finish. Ask about cleaning the metal. Ask about inspection hold points. Like, do they want to see the root before the hot pass is put in? Do they want to see the fit up before the root pass is put in? These kind of things. Is this stringers or a weave pass? And if, it, if, if weaving is allowed, what's the, what's the limit to the width of the weave? What's the amount of push through you want on the root pass? It varies from job to job. The codes, typically, if it's the same code, they don't vary, but, but people have preferences. Stainless food service, for instance, is very different than uh, a carbon steel line that's going to be running black liquor on a paper mill. The guy might, might, oh, I want it pushed through a good sixteenth because we're going to bend test this thing and we want to be able to grind it down and not go below flush at all. What's the maximum amount of reinforcement on the, on the uh, cover pass? Typically it's an eighth of an inch, but you, you might find somebody that says, you know what, it's an eighth, but if it's, if it's uniform and, and good looking, we'll let you go up to 532, we don't sweat it. Or it could be like eighth of an inch max, you're looked out if it goes over it at all. So ask the question and you'll know. On a 6G welding test, I've taken I've taken 6G welding tests where once you fit it up and are ready and you say you're ready to weld it, they come in and say, okay, tack it here, tack it there, put their big stamp on the top, don't move it. Don't move it up, don't move it down, don't roll it, don't do anything. If I come in here and it's moved, you're out of here. I have also taken 6G welding tests where they're like, you know what, don't roll it, but we'll let you move it We'll let you move it down for grinding because we don't want grinding sparks going all over the place. So there's a little leeway. Typically, typically though, you're not going to be able to move it at all. The height of the coupon is super important. You, if you put it to where you're comfortable on the bottom, but you can't hardly see the top of it, you're going to you're going to have problems. If you put it too low, you have to and you and, you're, and you got bad knees and you can't get, kneel down and make a transition and, and stand up as you're welding. That could give you problems. So think about these things. All this should be determined before you ever get there from prior practice but knowing all the details of the test and having practiced them to where you're confident getting a good night's sleep and then don't drink too much coffee or energy drinks all these things help as well let's get into the welding you can see I have cleaned down to bright metal roughly an inch back wouldn't hurt to go a little further but for the purposes of this little demo that's all I did I got everything taped up because this is 309 stainless root and you have to have an argon purge for that so I've taped everything up I put a clear lens in one end and let it purge for a while before I got this first tack on here at 70 to 80 amps just hot enough to barely keyhole and that I don't, I don't want to sink it through much being it's a tack dead on the top it's if you go too hot it's very easy to really sink those tacks in also, you want to ask the test supervisor how long, what's the maximum length of the tacks, especially on a joint this small, a two inch joint. A lot of times about a half inch is the, is the limit on the tacks. And oftentimes you're required to feather them on a test, even though I don't always feather for the real joint, because I've got some techniques that are, you know work better than feathering, but I feathered these for the just because most of the time, most of the tests I've taken, they wanted to inspect the, the tacks and make sure that they were feathered and so I'm taking several dry runs and I've got most of the joint taped off with painters tape here you'll be using whatever kind of tape they have at the job whatever they supply and this is kind of the technique for the root pass 332nd rod with a 1 8 gap kind of a loose 1 8 gap and pushing just a little bit in with a dip keyhole technique 
Let's get another look at it coming up the left hand side here. You can see I'm not walking the cup, I'm just free handing. I'm resting that TIG finger because it, it lets me rest close to the weld and, and uh, slides pretty smoothly, lets me make the whole round if I want to. But if you're watching the, the, the uh, sharp pointed edges of the bevel, you can see that they just barely, barely keyhole. And that's, that's where you want your heat. And for this part of the joint, this is one option, one way of holding the torch. I've got the TIG finger on my pinky, and I'm just going to rotate it as I come up. See, I've got a sharp edge, no, no land on there at all. It's called a feather edge. And I'm trying to keep that rod in there pretty often so, I, so that I don't let the keyhole get out of hand. I just barely want to see it keyhole and I want to push a little bit of rod in as I go because I like a little bit of a heavy root because there's less chance of melt back or suck back on the hot pass that way. So after I inspect the root, now it's time for the hot pass. And I turned it up just a little bit. I'm using 1 8 rod for the hot pass. So I'm somewhere between 85 and 100 amps for this. Not spending much time across the middle at all and just going to the sides and basically, basically pretty much trying to fill it up. Because this is, uh, even though it's schedule 80, this is counterboard, so the wall thickness is really not that great. So, root pass and a hot pass pretty much fill it up and get it ready for a cover pass. This is coming up the left side with the hot pass. Again, 1 8 rod, 309 rod. Not spending much time across the middle. Taking a little step as I zigzag up, trying to keep a good tight arc. And so that's the hot pass, and it's just a little bit sunken in below flush. And now we're going to walk the cup for the uh, cover pass. So this is walking the cup is different than wiggling or sliding the cup. When you're inside a bevel, like for a root pass, the cup you select a cup small enough to rest inside the bevel and just wiggle it. But this is like walking a 55-gallon drum across the floor. You can watch it. I'm going nice and slow here, but that is really the the, the best analogy I can give for walking the cup. It's just like just like tilting back a 55 gallon drum and then trying to move it across a shop floor by wiggling it one way and then turning it and wiggling it the other and you can see how my wrist is moving back and forth in order to accomplish that and two inch pipe is really kind of like a little bit tough to walk the cup on any smaller than that it's really tough like one inch is super tough but two inch could go either way you can you can freehand you can use a TIG finger you can walk the cup this is another method of holding the torch it's comfortable on the bottom and then as you come up gets gets less comfortable whereas holding your hand the other way like I'll show you in just a minute it's kind of uncomfortable to start with but becomes comfortable so see how I've got the torch cocked way back there somewhat uncomfortable to start with but after I travel just an inch or so it starts feeling better and that's really that's my preference rather than something becoming uncomfortable as I go now this is not the actual side, this is the other side, the left hand side arc shot here. So I used one side for arc shots and the other side for the far away shots, but it looks something like this. Now I'm on my knees here and I'm going to stand up right about there. Try to make a nice smooth transition going from kneeling to standing so that I didn't bobble and so that you can't tell it on the weld bead itself. And If you have to pause for just a moment and go a little bit slower for a ripple or two, you usually can without without any problems. This is the second bead, stacking it, trying to stack it over the the first one. And I, I intended to actually make this a two bead cover pass, but you can see right in here, just a little low. You see that shadow? It's a little has some undercut, and so I'm going to run another small bead with a three thirty second rod right in there, and make this into a three bead cap. And that is usually weld at the welder's discretion. The number of beads on a cover pass is usually uh, not a fixed amount. It's just that you don't want to go too far outside the bevel, but you don't want to have any undercut. Okay, I skipped fast forward a little bit over that third bead because it looked just like the second bead, but I'm just about to snap out here up top, trail out. This is a scratch start rig I'm using here with a Miller Thunderbolt. ACDC welder. And so there I turned a two bead into a three bead cover pass. I almost completely overlapped that second bead or he almost completely covered it up. But but at least now I don't have any undercut. I've got a somewhat uniform cover pass. Okay, well that about wraps it up. You saw me using a TIG finger for the root and the hot pass and then I walked the cup on the cover pass. A lot of guys would just freehand the whole thing. A lot of guys would 
walk the cup on the whole thing at two inches, kind of like uh, kind of like that size pipe where you could go either way. You get much smaller than two inch, walking the cup pretty hard. And if you're having trouble walking the cup, the TIG finger is for you. Hey, if you already have a TIG finger, if you'll do me a favor and leave a comment on this YouTube video, whether you like it, love it, or hate it, it'll help everybody else make an informed decision. So don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe for more if you like this kind of thing. And we'll see you right here next week.